10 seconds, probably a little bit more, we're gonna be online. Oh, yes, it's going. And then I have to, I will have to turn off the audio for a second. Because redirecting. <clears throat> Okay, it's working. Yay! Let me see. Okay, so we are online. Okay, I'm on YouTube. All right, I'm gonna get people uh, in. Okay, let's roll. Okay, um, okay. Should I wait? Oh, actually, no. You guys, had, I forgot. You guys are going to do the introduction. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna wait a little bit until people are in and then we're gonna start. Hi everybody. I'm just gonna put this stuff online. Okay. Oh, hi everybody. It's so nice to see you. Mm. This is so slow. See, my computer is getting really, really small. I think we can actually start in a couple of minutes. Um, so, <laughs> these are like the, the two minutes of, like I could have put a little bit of, uh, of music, but I forgot, sorry about that. <laughs> oh well, you always do this. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yeah. I'm admitting a few more people. I am going to see if I can. There you go.
All right. Uh, so I think we should um, start while uh, people are tuning in. Um, so welcome everybody um, to this um, art size salon. Just gonna make myself uh, the. I'm gonna pin myself. Um, I'm asking if everybody can uh, actually turn off your uh, video so uh, we can uh, only see uh, the speakers. Uh, it's also for our uh, YouTube uh, channel, otherwise you're going to see yourself uh, in the recordings. Anyway, uh, welcome to this uh, um, Outside Salon, March 25th, 2021. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Roberta Buiani, and I am the art director of the Artsci Salon at the Fields Institute for Research in Mathematical Sciences. Um, today, uh, we are welcoming uh, Vivian Xu and uh, Benjamin Bacon joining us from Kunshan, China. Um, so uh, before we start, I would like uh, to um, have this so you can read it actually <laughs> i would like to acknowledge um the university of toronto uh and uh, uh toronto which is uh, uh the uh, land uh that is sacred and that has been the site of uh, uh, human activity for fifteen thousand years um it is a land uh, uh but it is uh, the territory of the Yuron-Wenda Temple to First Nations, uh, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the dish with one spoon, one spoon belt covenant, which is an agreement uh, between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peacefully share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Um, today, uh, Toronto is uh, uh, the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and I'm actually very honored to be working in this community and connecting from this uh, territory. So, um, today, mm -hmm. um, today we're gathering online, and I know that so many of uh, the people who are uh, here are actually gathering from, uh, and I'm meeting more people, <laughs> I, uh, they are gathering from all over the world. And uh, um, this morning event is inspired and uh, made possible by uh, this program called The New One, uh, Learning Without Borders, uh, which is a program at the University of Toronto dedicated to interdisciplinary pedagogies, and uh, should I say ecological learning experiences. Um, students learn in class and outside, and uh, in this situation, mm. they are learning from Toronto, from India, from Saudi Arabia, from Hong Kong, and many other places. Uh, near Toronto or outside of Toronto and in Canada. And sometimes they connect at insane times. And should I say that our guests are connecting from China, which is 12 hours ahead. And so it's 10 o'clock at night. Uh, the pandemic has kept us apart, but we have learned to connect wide and far. Um, it was only natural that we would attempt to put together an event that is public, international, and uh, literally crosses borders. Um, this event is also part of Artsai Salon and mm. Laser Leonardo. Um, these two networks um, are actually very useful because they have allowed us to reach a variety of audiences, many colleagues and friends in Toronto, Canada, and beyond. Uh, so let me introduce you to uh, Nina Nena Cegledi, who spearheaded our connections with the wider laser uh, network. Nina. Hello. Uh, hello and welcome everybody, the presenters, and all the participants, whether they are close by or very far away, I am very pleased that this laser event in collaboration with the Art Science Salon and led 
by Roberta. And we have done this laser together for I think the last six years. And it's one of the two lasers in Eastern Canada, Montreal and Toronto. But what is really important that we are part of the much larger network today, we have laser events in 47 cities around the world from uh, Tehran to Hong Kong and uh, from New Zealand to North America and Europe. And this is really uh, an independent network in as much as it's affiliated with Leonardo, but each and every event is independently organized by the local people. And today, that's a very important facet. Uh, thank you very much, Roberta, and uh, everybody else. And now I give it back to Roberta. <laughs> thank you so much, Nina. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you. Um, so um, let me just say a few things uh, before we start. Um, in our teaching, uh, art, technology, and science are weighed together and inform each other. The arts here are not simply used to illustrate or to narrate, but to transmit and make sense of complexity without falling into given disciplinary and instrumental containers. Um, the artistic medium uh, becomes simultaneously a catalyst for interrogating nature and a new research tool able to display and communicate its complexity. Um, I want to welcome interdisciplinary artists uh, Benjamin Bacon and Vivian Chu, um, because I think that they're, they're a trans transdisciplinary design lab, the Dogma Lab, uh, not only um, uh, fits these shoes, let's put it this way, but it also uh, does much more because it, it creates like a much larger co uh, network. So not only combines a, a diverse range of mediums, um, including software, hardware, network systems, online platforms, raw, da raw data, biomaterials and living organisms, but also considers, and I quote from their uh, description, the entanglement of the technological systems with other realities including surveillance, sensory, bodily, environmental, and living systems. And we will see, I, I saw the first slide of Vivian, and I think we're gonna, we are here for a ride. Um, they are uh, interested in uh, complex hybrid networks that bridge the digital uh, with the uh, physical and biological realm speculating on possible synthesized uh, feature. Um, I could go on and on and on about them, uh, but I think you can read uh, um, the description from uh, uh, the description of the of the uh, event, uh, and I think that their uh, presentation will talk for them. Um, I would like to ask you a couple of, of, of favors uh, now that we start the presentation. So first, please make sure that all the video and audio are off during the presentation, so, so that I can easily pin our guests. Uh, also. Um, I keep, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> uh, feel free to use the chat. So the chat is active and I saw that some people already started using it and ask questions at any time uh, in the chat. Uh, we will go back and uh, read the questions later. We will try to uh, put together all the, um, uh, the threads. Uh, so when um, the talk is over and uh, during our discussion time, um, you can raise your hand and uh, use the chat or send me questions uh, to my youth team email, which was in the registration. Um, but like you can also, you can also uh, post it on YouTube and you can also, uh, so like I'll try to, to, we'll try to monitor everything. And finally, I ask that everybody be civilized, please. Um, but I know that you are because like, I, I really love um, this um, group and I think that uh, everybody is like really, uh, fantastic. Um, so I think that great events are coming also with great public. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce you to uh, Vivian and Benjamin. And I think Vivian wants to share, you're going to share your uh, mm, Yeah, I will share um, screen. screen. Hold on one second here. Um, I think, can everybody see? Yes, you are. Yes. Okay. So, um, 
I'm going to just do this here. All right. So um, first of all, uh, thank you, Roberta and Nina, for inviting Benjamin and myself. Um, uh, I think this is a great opportunity for us to introduce to you very briefly um, some of the things that we've been experimenting and playing around with and also some of our um, philosophies when it comes to research. Um, so um, to just give a little bit of a background, um, Benjamin and myself, uh, we started um, Dogma Lab uh, maybe uh, five or six years ago. Um, and uh, although I think the, the title of the talk is called um, Inside Dogma Lab, actually today we're going to focus on um, more recent things that we've been working with. Um, so a little bit about our background, uh, Benjamin, and I, uh, we both come from this program at Parsons in New York City called Design and Technology. And so um, actually we are trained in design school. Um, before that, Benjamin has worked with technology um, and in the techno technological industries um, for 15 years. Um, uh, and then for myself, I have mainly worked in uh, contemporary art and also sometimes uh, did a bit of writing. Uh, I was uh, previously trained, we, we were both actually previously trained in film. Um, and then later on, um, now we do a lot of things between um, technology, art, design, and science. Um, and so just to give you a little bit of our background, because um, I think that explains a lot to our sort of diverse interests in terms of projects that we are interested in. Um, <clears throat> okay, so. So um, a little bit about Dogma Lab. Um, this really grew out of the environment and ecosystem of China. Um, and so uh, we started this lab together in, um, in Shanghai uh, when we moved down here uh, a few years ago. Um, and so uh, the environment of Shanghai is a little bit unique in the sense that um, it, it is this uh, a city that uh, combines entertainment, uh, art and culture and uh, commerce because it's one of the big commercial cities on the um, east coast of China. Um, that into this one big hybrid space. And so um, for Dogma Lab, we, uh, you, you see a, a list of things that we work with or, or things that we experiment with. And um, some of these things, uh, as you can see, have this sort of commercial side to it. And then the others are more research and educational. And so um, for Dogma Lab specifically, we do a little bit of both. But I think for us, uh, some of these investigations, um, it, it's not important to us whether it's um, you know, one thing or another, uh, but rather uh, it's in, an interesting topic or subject matter. Um, okay, so. So actually, um, uh, what, what I want to, before we get into um, some projects, and I think, Ben, you can jump in uh, anytime you want um, if, if I'm uh, not being accurate with some of these things. But um, uh, I wanted to um, uh, show you a little bit about our uh, sort of conceptual framework for creative research. And so today, uh, we'll be very quickly going through several projects that we've been uh, experimenting with in the past um, few years. Um, and we've been actually uh, very much interested in uh, uh, industry 4.0 and things like that and all the things around that, um, all the different mediums. Um, the way we look at it is we are really interested in this idea of uh, um, three, three layers of reality that coexist uh, through networks on a global scale, and that these three uh, sort of digital, uh, these three sort of systems um, in their own right uh, um, form this sort of hybrid reality that we live in today, and they sort of work upon each other to create all the, the diverse happenings of today. So these three are uh, the digital, the physical, and the organic. Um, and then um, within that area, our research interest, uh, I think maybe actually this slide, Ben, do you want to describe virtual societies and disruptive yeah. technology? Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, we, we've, we've kind of made a decision here that, that sometimes it's confusing when you have too many different speakers trying to speak at the same time. So Vivian's going to kind of drive for the most most part for the presentation. But uh, so, you know, we have Dogma Lab and this is something that we've been doing for, uh, I, I think Vivian mentioned kind of several years, but it's actually been almost close to 10 now, which is pretty incredible, uh, eight, nine, 10 years. Uh, and that's really been something that has been um uh, uh, you know, exploration from everything from kind of experimental uh, design and art to all the way to doing commercial projects and things like that, which is which is all great. Uh, but 
um, you know, we, we definitely have a lot more different interests and things like that. Uh, both Vivian and I, uh, you know, t teach at uh, Duke Quinchon University, which is a new uh, liberal arts model interdisciplinary university uh, that's a, a cross between uh, Wuhan University and Duke University. Uh, and it's neither of those universities. Uh, it's actually, uh, we, they, it, we've set out to do a kind of a different model than the other joint ventures in, in China. So this is actually a brand brand new university that's taking support from both of those instead of being like some kind of a, a, a extension campus or anything like that. So with that, we really have the opportunity to really redefine how uh, not just the academic side of things, but also, um, how we would structure labs, centers, and things like that. So uh, part of where we're, we're taking kind of deeply into our research interests and looking at how we can uh, uh, apply that to a network of labs uh, underneath um, uh, kind of arts and humanities, social science, and compu uh, uh, computer science, or natural sciences, sorry. Uh, so there's actually this new degree that uh, we'll be kind of rolling out in the next year called computation and design, which actually has three specific major tracks uh, uh, that's pulling from each one of these disciplines, disciplinary areas. Uh, so what part of what we've done with this lab is just, um, uh, we're calling it the disruptive uh, technology, or sorry, uh, <laughs> design technology and radical media. Uh, so it's been a long uh, 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 triad of labs. Um, and uh, underneath there, uh, we really wanted to look at what the essence of that means uh, when you're thinking from everything from, let's say, uh, digital societies and what's happening on kind of the sociology level of things, uh, what's happening within natural sciences, sciences such as uh, you know, the bi biologies, material science, and so on. Uh, and then again, looking at kind of what's happening between art, technology, uh, and, and a lot of the innovation that's happening. So basically what we've done is we've taken uh, the ideas from the previous slide that uh, uh, Vivian had shown, and we've uh, basically created these uh, uh, three triad labs that sit kind of on top of a, a series of other ones. Uh, one of those is... Uh, <clears throat> Virtual societies or digital societies lab, which is really uh, could be viewed as anywhere between the interest. Get that? Could you try again? Oh, sorry, my my phone just talked back. Or my uh, anywhere between uh, you know looking at uh, you know field work within ethnographic studies within let's say digital societies and digital anthropology all the way through uh, the impacts of of. Uh, uh, social policy and things like that. Uh, disruptive technologies, which is uh, really looking at how current and future technologies, along with older technologies, uh, but more kind of like, what does this black box technology means and how could we either hack it or extend it into a different form of use, uh, both creatively and or industry-wise. And then uh, material ecologies, which is, I'm gonna let Vivian explain this because this, this, this part's definitely her baby. So, um, yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention our, our sort of academic background. Um, this would make this section make mo much more sense. Um, uh, but uh, it, the material ecologies really looks at materials not as um, static, but as processes, as sort of ecosystems, and to uh, see what kind of um, uh, things we can derive from them, whether it's uh, uh, new applications or sort of intelligent ways of design. So, um, and then yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry, I was just going to add one other thing, although I think you're maybe getting it there, where you have these top layer of labs, and what they do is they really foster kind of uh, uh, nodes of other types of labs that can bubble up for short periods of time and then uh, kind of fade back in, uh, uh, submerge themselves after being emerging, depending on what's being studied and what's being researched. So, yeah. Okay. So, so, so like Ben was saying, um, uh, the design uh, technology and radical media lab system that we are currently working on um, and the building is still being built. Hopefully it'll be uh, either open end of this year or early next year. 
um, physically, um, is uh, this sort of triad uh, system of theory and practice combined um, in an ecosystem that sort of feeds into each other and generates uh, hopefully new things. Um, the theory, uh, as Ben mentioned, is uh, uh, what we're really interested in is in the virtual world and how that impacts social behavior and um, uh, other things uh, under the digital societies lab. And then with methods and tools, which is the lab that Ben is mainly um, heading um, it, it focuses on disruptive technologies and then uh, materials uh, is the area that I'm interested in, which is material ecologies. And the idea is that uh, with method and tools and um, sort of theoretical research, uh, you can basically uh, build uh, almost anything. Um, <clears throat> and, and so uh, the reason also why we thought of um, having the lab system in this kind of a sense, and also it, this helps us think about um, uh, things that we would like to work with and research um, uh, moving forward is that, uh, you know, especially nowadays with the fast paced development of technologies, a lot of these trends um, kind of come and go very fast. And so rather than to have something that is based on a very specific medium, uh, we were interested, and, and I think our, also our, our own interests um, uh, span a diverse area of, of mediums. And it's uh, a lot of the times it's about the inter interaction of that medium with the um with, with other things uh, that interest us, um, that we would have uh, the foundation labs be something that is more core and fundamental and then have certain sort of medium trends um, come and go in secondary labs uh, that are more project-based and um, uh, react to the, the sort of uh, uh, trends that are happening. And so this is, uh, I think this is really to give you a base understanding of where we're coming from and uh, what we're in our interests are. Um, and then I think I think uh, next I'll, I'll pass it back to Ben um, and he can introduce some of the projects uh, that we've been doing. So um, I think we'll start off with some uh, individualistic projects that we've been working under the dogma umbrella as experiments uh, and, and then move towards more collaborative um, uh, collective work that we've been doing together, which is sort of uh, more of what we've been doing the past uh, couple of years. <clears throat> Yeah, so, you know, with with all of this kind of being said, Dogma Lab hasn't been lost in the, in the mix of things. This is, Dogma is definitely much more of our personal uh, kind of collaborative exploration of, of uh, uh, kind of where our interests are lying at the time. Um, so, but, you know, a lot of these projects, uh, so, you know, definitely the ones that I, I'm going to show here have all developed through um, different aspects of working together uh, uh, with Vivian on, on um, uh, you know, conceptual ideas, uh, some of the technology, some of the different things like that, uh, e even if they're, they're uh, more um, uh, kind of holistically individual. So um, I don't have control over the screen, so you can, you can flip. <laughs> okay, so... Um, so this is an experiment, it's called Little Sound Machines. This is in, uh, partially coming from my interest within utilizing and working with um, uh, machine learning and neural networks, uh, and also coming from my uh, um, love of both performance and creation of music. And uh, so for a very long period of time in my life, and even now, I've always experimented with trying to create new types of uh, Kind of musical interfaces or different type of composition uh, interface. Uh, sometimes that's more on the technology side, sometimes it's more on other sides. But the Little Sound Machines was really a, a, a both a speculative piece about what would happen if you took a lot of different found objects um, around, um, in, in our case, specifically the lab, things that had been sitting around for a long time, pieces of old uh, artwork, and so on and so forth. And uh, you basically utilized, uh, not for the most part, a fully off-the-shelf uh, 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 machine learning uh, system, but a fairly off-the-shelf system where I've done some programming tricks and stuff like that, but essentially setting up a recursive uh, number of models that are basically comp composing music, uh, composing parts of music, and sending it back to, uh, sending it to another uh, um, pre-trained model that then modifies that piece and then sends it back to the other model, uh, modifies it again, sends it to the little instruments, 
brings it back in and then just recursively continually grows over periods of time and periods of time. So um, uh, for example, some of the longest periods of time that this piece has been shown, um, you know, a little bit over a month in periods of time where basically the AI has just continually uh, recursively uh, uh, created new, uh, um, um, uh, new patterns of, of MIDI and music to basically be played. So it's also a, a, a electro, um, uh, uh, utilizes things like solenoids and other types of um, uh, mechanical parts to basically create the sound. So you, you can feel free just to kind of flip through if uh, uh, I think I'm, so this was, uh, I had a whole bunch of old sol solenoids sitting around from uh, a previous project uh, art piece that I had about 10 years ago. And I took those along with some spare metal pieces that are out there and I made a xylophone. Uh, and then just basically created the electronics to trigger uh, each of the sol uh, solenoids uh, via you know, MIDI to control voltage. Uh, so that was the kind of is the main instrument that's that's kind of running the whole thing. Uh, but then you get into a lot more of the different <coughs> uh, percussive items uh, as in the next slides here that would create different rhythms and so on. So in the end, what uh, in the end, what you basically had was three different systems creating melody, harmonies, and rhythms that basically play for extended periods of time. And just to see how these models would eventually change over periods. Uh, and uh, so some very interesting results from that. Um, not always musical uh, in what we would consider musical to our ears. Um, uh, though, uh, obviously, that's always a personal preference. Uh, I tend to like noise and noisy things so um uh but uh yeah but the results were very interesting to see what would happen if you just continually pass it to one model to another so why don't we move on to the next piece yep uh it's the slightest change can you see nope <laughs> we're having the same That's issue we had uh, the other day <laughs> the magnetic body instrument okay so the the next piece I, i'm not sure what slide this is like for some reason it's not updating on my computer but um so this is another exploration into uh, both kind of speculative design within, uh, you know, what happens with trans uh, with the ideas of transhumanism and the, the body uh, augmentation and extending our senses uh, and so on and so forth. But then also looking at the idea of going back to uh, that theme of creating new kind of interfaces into playing with uh, uh, electromagnetic. Uh, uh, musical interfaces, so uh, and visual in this case. So uh, what I essentially ended up doing was uh, embedding magnets in my fingers. So I uh, took uh, one evening and uh, opened up my fingers and put magnets in them and let them heal up. Uh, and but it, it, as a result of that, part of the other part of the project was to create different types of uh, synthesizers and um, kind of theremin type devices. Uh, uh, that were both visual and audio. So um, these different devices, some of them had some other types of input uh, into them, but basically things that I could control with just my magnets. Uh, so, and then that, what resulted from this was a series of different um, um, performances. Uh, so for the, in the end result of this, the main, main outcome of this would be, it was a performance piece. So all of the different, um, uh, kind of um, uh, interference visuals and things like that were being uh, as a result of me basically using uh, one of my uh, different fingers uh, um, uh, for the most part interfering with uh, different types of interfaces that I created. So, so I, I went through all the sites. Should I go to the next project? Uh, yes, please. Sorry. I, I can't tell because I've actually got a blank screen here. <laughs> so oh, okay. So the next one okay. is Pro. Okay, so uh, so I'm kind of winging this since I, I, I still haven't gotten an image here. But uh, so Probe is is one of the latest pieces, and this is actually more of a series that I've been working on. So I've got uh, multiple ones coming. Uh, this is have been collected and is on permanent display at uh, UN Art Center in uh, Shanghai. Uh, and uh, again, this is looking at. Uh, more of looking at speculation, but speculation of uh, looking at uh, space travel and exploration uh, and how um, if we were to 
or other civilizations in other places would travel uh, and look into uh, trying to find life or uh, different types of uh, planets and things like that, we probably wouldn't send ourselves. We'd send some form of a satellite. We'd send some form of other mechanical life, um, uh, partially just due to distance and things like that. So a lot of this is looking at that kind of uh, idea uh, of, of how life would transfer to another planet and what types of things like that. So this really comes, uh, this mechanical sculpture also has, uh, uh, oh, okay, I can actually see this now so I can kind of explain it. So it's, it's, uh, um, um, it's about six, or, I'm sorry, it's about, a, about um, I'm really bad with my, my centimeters. It's taller than me, it's about six to eight. Uh, to uh, seven feet tall, um, American, sorry. Um, and uh, um, uh, the top part actually moves around in a circle. Uh, and up in there, we have a whole series of different cameras that uh, is basically tracking uh, the people and uh, that are moving around in the environment. And it's taking, uh, uh, it's basically taking that tracking, finding out that if it's a, if it's a, live or not, and then databasing that metadata. In, as, and as a result, it's creating these, every 30 minutes, creating this heat map in the bottom part of it. Uh, that basically shows the movement and how many different people are were in the area. So this is kind of the first of an exploration of these kind of mechanical life probes that I've been creating. Uh, and uh, there's actually another one that will be uh, sent out to um, Art Laboratory Berlin, I, I, I see Chris Chris here, um, uh, a little later this this uh, summer. So uh, these are just some different um, uh, views of it. So uh, so I'm gonna leave it there and pass this back to Vivian. I guess this is the image of the heat map um, uh, on the sort of uh, curvature screen uh, in the middle section of the installation um, when it maps things. Um, so um, uh, I, I'll introduce uh, one, one project um, that uh, I did. Uh, I'll, I'll introduce one be mainly because this project took a very long time to do. Um, and so uh, like Ben mentioned before, I, uh, I'm also interested in the designing of machines, but um, from a sort of organic perspective, also taking inspiration from the natural, syst uh, natural systems. Um, and so <clears throat> specifically, I was interested in animal architecture, which, um, and, and uh, uh, specifically the work of Mike Hansel, uh, built by animals, where uh, as a behavioral scientist, he studied animals uh, building behaviors. Um, and a lot of that was for the purpose of modeling new ways of thinking about um, what intelligent models could be. Um, and so I, I was uh, interested in making, um, the, for the silkworm project, I was really interested in animals that built, uh, in this case, silkworms. Um, other animals that I was looking at were uh, bees and um, uh, ants. And so um, what really inspired me with the silkworm is that uh, I, I questioned if we could uh, potentially make a, a th um, 3D printer um, that uh, was a biomachine ecosystem where the silkworm was the input and the silk was the output and it could have its own internal logic um, where we didn't have to, uh, where human intervention was uh, not necessary, but also uh, that the silkworm wouldn't produce something that it would normally produce such as a cocoon, rather it would produce something that was uh, organic that you, humans actually couldn't produce but um, uh, but it, Silkworm had to uh, function with the machine to produce that. And so um, throughout this process, I had made multiple prototypes um, and some of them worked and some of them didn't. Um, and, and with these prototypes, uh, I, I started to observe, um, as I'm testing out things that work and don't work, uh, I started uh, observing Silkworm behavior, spinning behavior and figuring out how can I hack that spinning behavior and uh, from their, their perception of space. Um, and for that purpose, I uh, because it was uh, useful to also track how multiple silkworms interacted in one space and how they negotiated um, uh, shared space, because uh, they're quite efficient. I also uh, raised two types of colored silkworms that spun natural colored silk. Um, the left side one was from, um, uh, uh, is uh, this method, it's, uh, dis, uh, 
this method developed by Singaporean scientists where you feed them um, uh, colored dyed food um, as they're developing their silk glands and then they should be able to spin colored silk and then the right side is genetically modified uh, silkworms uh, that were developed by uh, Japanese scientists and uh, you can get both of those because China is such a big silkworm country you can get both of those really easily on the Chinese version of eBay. Um, uh, and, and so uh, the color silk was mainly to um, be able to track silkworm space negotiation through uh, the color of the differentiation of the color um, and therefore understand how they uh, move and work in space as they're spinning. Um, and then of course, with that, I also created a series of um, uh, experiments uh, before making the machines and while making the machines, uh, putting them in different types of spaces to see what kind of spaces would confuse the, their perception of space. And so those are some of the experiment results that I had. Um, and then this is uh, the, the last um, prototype that I made um, for this series. Uh, it's semi-works. Uh, it, it, so um, it was uh, supported by Art Laboratory Berlin, um, a shout out to them again, um, and uh, it, it was shown also uh, in, in Germany, and so uh, when it showed in Art Lab, I think it didn't fully work, but then it moved on to Capilita, and there I, I think it produced some resu results for the one silkworm that spun in it that uh, worked and was somewhat interesting. Um, and so uh, and then these are some earlier results of uh, different types of, um, because this, this machine, um, what it does is it spins uh, horizontally and then it spins and then it stops and then it's for, for 30 minutes and then it spins very slowly and then it stops. And all of this is designed to disorient the silkworm's perception of its environment. Um, and so to, to get to that kind of a, a design, um, uh, approach, I had to do some of my hand spun own experiments. And so those were some earlier results of silkworm spun, um, uh, it, where the environment spun every now and then, and they would sort of uh, be confused and then create these sort of organic structures of silk. Um, ben, do you want to talk about horologic? Uh, yeah, I can start. I can start it off. We, we can go back and forth on this one. Uh, so horologic Solum, uh, this really comes from, uh, you know, a, a couple of different domains of, of both of our interests in, in you know, uh, thinking about sound design, thinking about different types of media, uh, but also really going back to Claude Shannon uh, and the ideas of how do you communicate uh, in communication theory. Uh, so looking at, um, uh, you know, how does communicate, uh, when we communicate, um, uh, the what happens over time and what's the loss within the system uh, and uh, some of the different theories that 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 first originally comes comes from him so yeah and and I I think one of the things that was uh, really interesting for us, especially looking at the, the types of, um, you know, since we are both uh, teaching in the area of media and arts, um, you can't help but think about medium, uh, media. And, and the thing that's really changed today, as opposed to um, even a few, de a couple decades ago, is that uh, media has become much more com complex with uh, technology such as AI um, um, and uh, it, the internet uh, as it emerges and matures and, and all that kind of stuff. And so a lot of the times, um, uh, but, but ironically, um, or not ironically, um, but what what I what is uh, becoming maybe a little bit limited is that uh, uh, while uh, older models of communication systems and communication theories uh, uh, they they sort of present this uh, somewhat simplistic or straightforward. Um, uh, communication model. Um, and a lot of the technology is designed based on some of these models, as we can see with newer types of uh, technologies. Um, it, it, it's not as simple and it, it encompasses uh, these new mediums, such as the internet, for instance, uh, encompasses a, a great 
a great slice, of, a, a great part of our lives um, and culture and society, and in fact, uh, generates even uh, newer behaviors that we haven't anticipated before. And so um, I think that uh, taking from uh, Henry Jenkins' uh, book, uh, Convergence Culture, where he starts to address some of these through, through uh, research and fandoms, uh, in online fandoms, um, we were really interested in looking at uh, these new convergence media medias, such as uh, VR, such as the internet, such as possibly AI, um, and how uh, maybe older models or older ways, uh, frameworks of looking at communication fail to address the complexities of these new um, these new technologies and mediums and how they uh, relate to our, our uh, social behaviors. Um, and then the other, another um, thing that we were really interested in, um, which is also uh, something that is becoming more and more uh, prevalent is uh, some of the issues that uh, we face today, some of the existential crises we face today um, often uh, are, are issues that will um, that exist uh, on time scales that are beyond human time scales. And so um, I think uh, it, it's probably a, a little bit of a cliche example, but just with something as simple as COVID, um, you know, the, the sort of live social memory of uh, the last a uh, truly huge global pandemic was a hundred years ago. And even in the past hundred years, uh, a lot of uh, that lived experience and memory has been forgotten. Um, uh, despite of all our technologies and all our storage devices and all our um, uh, excellent communication devices. And so um, some of these questions really, uh, we, we really thought uh, hard about some of these questions um, and and wanted to uh, create something that uh, reflected some of this. So this, this image is the uh, Ancalos uh, spent nuclear fuel repository where it, it, it just completing it takes a hundred years. Uh, and then of course the nuclear waste possibly stored in there will uh, take uh, 10,000 years uh, to, to, to dissolve. And so then uh, the, the, uh, with this kind of a case, um, there were a lot of people uh, who were trying to then, uh, I think artists were involved to try to think about this kind of a communication problem and to see how can we, uh, through graphical means, uh, design something that uh, can communicate into basically eternity. And there's this uh, really great documentary film called Into Eternity that talks about all of this. And, and, um, and that a lot of these uh, things are, it's, it's very difficult because culture changes so fast. Um, storage uh, devices uh, sometimes fail because they are it, at the end of the day, physical. And so uh, despite of um, us living in a very uh, hyper digital world, hyper technological world, a lot of these uh, things all have multiple layers, as we mentioned before, the physical layer, the organic layer, and the digital layer. Um, and so, and I, yeah. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was, gonna, I was gonna just add in one thing. You know, in one of the other issues that we have is, you know, in, in thinking about time and deep time and, uh, the different types of layers of time that we live in. And we'll kind of readdress that uh, partially within the installation. But, uh, you know, when we think about how we store knowledge, so, you know, and, and, you know, these references are going and talking about the life, life spans of, 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 you know, radioactivity and things like that. But when we look at the mediums that we store things on, uh, so, you know, when it's an analog type of medium or a piece of paper, or analog tape, like real to real magnetic tape and so on and so forth, those have lifespans that actually, as we get into, as we've entered and are now pretty firmly, firmly planted in the digital age, become more abstracted in how that data is stored. Um, you know, is this something, even if the device itself could last for 100, 200, 300, um, 10,000 years, would somebody be able to even read that data? Right. Uh, so there's one one question here, which is just about language and symbolism. But now we are we're we're also just abstracting that into ones and zeros and in cryptography and all these other layers. So. Yeah, so um, Horologic Sola mainly focuses on um, one particular artifact of uh, that that um, strives to represent human civilization, which is the uh, Voyager Golden Record. And so this record in 1977 was launched with Voyager 1 into space and is still in space right now. And what we thought this was really a very interesting cultural relic 
um, in a few uh, different layers. Um, first of all, uh, at this, this was created in 1977. And at the time, uh, it, it, uh, one, th one was that it wasn't long after the sort of uh, communication technology and information technology boom. Um, and um, at the time people had this, um, I, it's hard to say right now because we still do. It's, it's this. Uh, it's this item that has been sent out, and we still don't really know the end uh, uh, ending of that story yet. Um, but if we look back at some of the things that were recorded on the uh, the, the this disc specifically, um, a lot of the uh, assumptions of how it could communicate to um, other beings was maybe naive. Uh, if we look at it from today's perspective, um, and and maybe there were a lot of failings in how it was designed. But at the same time, um, it, we, we see this almost as this um, uh, point of bifurcation in which this golden record item itself uh, was sent out into space and the time it was like a time capsule of that time in the 70s um, but that that time in the 70s in fact is disappearing from our own cultural memory as we move forward in a sort of culture on earth um, and so um, looking at something like that, um, and then and then of course, uh, twenty years after uh, the Voyager was sent out, um, uh, there was a sort of um, anniversary uh, edition of this, where the, uh, this uh, journalist he went and collected all the stories behind all the the, the recordings on the Golden Record and compiled uh, another version of it uh, that now passes down into history. Um, and so we thought this was something that was uh, really interesting to us. It was, uh, you, I guess you can see it as almost a man's uh, attempt to sort of distill a moment in our, in our civilization and then to sort of store it forever and to communicate it with somebody else um, other than ourselves. And so, um, so we thought we would take the contents of this golden record and um, put it into this uh, decaying sound system. Um, and so this is actually a fairly, um, so we, we, we were able to uh, find on, on, um, online two old school records that roughly were uh, made and, and mediums that were used to, to play things. Uh, they're not records, sorry. Uh, they're, they're tape machines. Uh, they were made in the 80s, I think, from Japan. And so to use really old media to play this really old content and then to run, uh, as the tape is playing, to run it through a system of decay um, and to uh, really... Um, see how that sound dissolves over time. And so um, maybe what I'll do is show, I don't know if um, the internet is good enough for us to play a short video um, or if it's just better to explain it. Um, I don't know, we I'll can try. try. Okay. I send greetings I send on behalf greetings of the people of our planet. Of our planet. We, step out of our we step out of our solar into system into the universe, into the universe only peace, only peace and friendship, friendship to teach, and to teach if, we are teach called upon, if we are called upon to be taught if we are fortunate. If we, are fortunate. we know full well we that our planet and all, all its inhabitants are but a small part, a small of, this part of this immense universe that surrounds, surrounds us, that surrounds and it is with humility and, and, hope, humility that and hope, hope that we take this step. As the Secretary As the General, General of the United Nations, Nations an organization of 147 member states who represent the whole of the human inhabitants of the planet Earth, I send I greetings on behalf of our planet. We step we out of our solar system into the universe, seeking only peace and seeking friendship. We are called upon to be called to be We are called upon to be called 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 to be Thank 
the small part of this immense universe and it is the humility of the So I'm not I'm not sure how much of that's coming through. I know I'm not getting any sound on my my end. Uh, it should be a pretty heavy static at this point. Um, so basically, uh, just to explain some of what's happening here in the process is that um, um, uh, we've basically created tape loops that are roughly uh, they're 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 a little over six meters long, uh, and it pre it is pretty much about 43, 48 seconds long, somewhere in there. I can't remember the exact seconds, but basically the, we have these long cables. There's two different tape, uh, real to real tape machines. Uh, and uh, they're basically strung through different configurations. Uh, and basically over about an eight hour period, it's going through different uh, 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 kind of uh, these metal structures. And some of them have sandpaper and some of them have other types to basically simulate the idea of it's slowly decaying over time. Obviously, it's it's it's, it's uh, uh, needing to kind of accelerate the process uh, through that to uh, basically uh, 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 exemplify what, what we're trying to get with. But basically, by the end of the day, at some points, the tapes break, but it basically becomes this real static key symbol similar to um, uh, the CBR, so the cosmic background radiation, where you know we see this on our old TV sets and radio, and we hear this microwave background. So it has a, actually a kind of a similar sound to that staticky sound. Um, and and um, I think that uh, this project specifically poses a question. Um, I think for the next um, step that we want to uh, begin to do is to uh, uh, conduct a, a series of workshops and use these workshops as both a method for research and for, for practice for field research um, specifically and to find diverse audiences to, to pose this kind of a question and then to um, do workshops around how can we, um, what, how can we really uh, think about mediums today, technologies today and uh, the sort of, um, uh, issues across time that we have to deal with and how can we uh, design more uh, fitting uh, uh, communication toolkits uh, for the future um, to deal with some of these issues that we, we are facing. Um, so, and, and let me just add in the one last section dealing with the time because we, we did, we did um, kind of uh, tease uh, deep time and different things like that earlier in the, in the presentation. And uh, so we actually have a couple of different mechanisms happening here. We have one, uh, the tape, uh, the tape uh, machines themselves, so which is kind of a machine time, which has its loop count that's happening. You have the counters in front of the tape machines that are basically doing a, count, uh, a second count from the beginning, uh, the first time the loop plays to the time it ends. Uh, and then you have uh, the performance time and the exhibition time in which the, uh, the installation sits in. Uh, and then after each day when, when uh, the tape loops are basically inaudible uh, or broken, uh, they get packaged up and put on a wall as, uh, as kind of uh, archival evidence of, of what's happening. So eventually, so the, the, the audio within this uh, video it's actually a compilation of different parts of the performance that's been put together into a very short period of time. So, um, so that, that's kind of looking at that aspect there, so. Yeah. Um, ben, do you want to introduce the last project? 
Yeah, so this is this is one of the projects we're working on now. We've we've got a couple of series of projects, but this is one of the ones that we that that we're really excited about. But it's a very kind of long term project, which is called uh, appropriately just the Antarctica project at the moment. Uh, we don't have a fancy name for it, uh, but <clears throat> we've been working with a, a, a group of scientists, uh, uh, some of them at Duke Quinn John, some of them. Uh, uh, kind of around the world, uh, who have been working together and collecting um, uh, water samples uh, throughout Antarctica, uh, mainly kind of in the South Antarctica Sea area. Uh, so we have roughly about 500 samples, uh, and uh, those samples are at different depths and different things like that. Uh, and uh, so uh, for each of these samples, there's somewhere between 1,000 to 1,500 um, uh, uh, um, organisms in it uh, and roughly, I, I can't remember the exact percentage, but uh, a great deal of them are uh, new new uh, organisms that we hadn't, haven't seen before. Uh, but uh, right now there, we're just starting to get the data of um, uh, the sequence base pairs uh, from each one of these uh, uh, samples, uh, along with its GPS data, the, the depth where it was taken, its carbon footprint, uh, and of various other other data, um, uh, population densities of, of each of these um, novel organisms. So, so we're taking that data, <clears throat> and we're um, uh, basically uh, moving that into a whole bunch of series of experiments uh, more, with more of a creative output. Uh, um, partially because uh, one of the goals uh, from the scientists is to figure out ways to um, uh, communicate this to the public uh, and communicate how, how do we visualize this data? How do we uh, uh, get the uh, public invested in, the, in not just this project, but what's happening there within the ecosystem, but also around the world. Um, and and not, so not to get too deep into that, but we've been doing some very, really interesting experiments within game engines and VR with mapping of uh, population densities along with the different other environmental variables uh, um, on some basic 3D objects at this point to create these kind of generative environments. Um, um, and that's all I'm going to say about it, just because there's a lot going on and some of it is just brand new ideas and some of it's real experiments right now. Uh, but re uh, look forward within the next year-ish time for some uh, new uh, uh, projects coming from this. So. Thank you. Thank you. I, think I will maybe stop sharing. Roberta, is that? As you want, um, you, can, you can stop. Yeah, um, just leave for like a five seconds uh, uh, your contacts so that people can actually uh, take it down. I will also, uh, like the, the, their contact is also in uh, um, on our website. So um, yeah. Um. <laughs> okay. Um, so thank you so much for uh, this uh, fantastic presentation. Um, as I had um, anticipated, um, the the projects were really uh, dense, and we were going for a ride, definitely. Um, so I, I want to to hear from people um, if they have any uh, question up. Uh, uh, of their uh, head, or if they um, they want some clarification, because I have questions. But yeah, I'm gonna wait for people to finish. Uh, you can write them on the chat, or you can also uh, raise your hand if you want. Okay. So. In the meantime, I want to ask you a question. Um, oh, there's people who are like <laughs> chiming in. Uh, Antje asks, um, could this lab work anywhere in the world? Ben? <laughs> well, what, what, when you mean lab, what do you mean? Uh, did you mean lab in the sense of Dogma Lab, uh, the new labs that we're working on or uh, uh, some of the, like the Antarctica project uh, kind of consortium that we're working with. All, all um, your lives. Sure, we're, we're happy to travel, we're happy to work. <laughs> all 
right now i think before the before the physical space is built uh for the dtrm labs um uh we are a virtual lab right now (laughs) Um, basically you're seeing our lab, we're in our basement studios, uh, one on each side. So <laughs> this is the lab right now. Um, so I'm looking at, so China being a specific choice, I mean, th- th- yes and no. I mean, I've been, um, I, you know, I left New York about full time about 10 years ago, but I'd been before that for about five years, progressively being, you know, started off at, as a three week. Uh, trip then became a 15 uh, you know a 15 day then it became a three month then it became a six month really quickly with a lot of the different things I was getting into um uh so I mean part of it is a personal preference um but you know as far as uh um, as far as the type of work we're doing I mean part of part of what keeps us here is is uh obviously Vivian is from from China, uh, that 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 helps. <laughs> but you know, it's also you know we are built, we're in the middle of, of of being active participants in building a new university and things like that. So that that keeps us here for the time being. Uh, but I think there is an openness by both of us to to you know move other places and work in other places and do different things like that also. So. And also, um, uh, the thing about the thing that's also, I think, uh, to some degree interesting about the China environment is that, um, uh, you know, while I, I know that many of you are also con- co- uh, very much connected to a lot of the people here who are doing the art side stuff. Um, uh, but there is also that other sphere of the reality of China and um, uh, this, I think that this, this uh, talk won't give, uh, there's not enough time to do it justice, but if you're interested, uh, so we actually host at uh, Duke Quinshan University for our own uh, community and students, we host a media and art speaker series, which hopefully we'll, we'll be inviting some of you slowly to participate as well. Um, and uh, one of our uh, recent speakers, Eric Chen, who is a design curator, long time, um, both internationally, but uh, m- mainly based in China recently, um, his talk mainly talks about this sort of um, uh, bizarre environment of the commercial and the entertainment and the culture all mishmashed and mashed up into one and trying to do experiments in that space um, and the types of reactions and meanings that you, you can get out of that. So if you're interested, I could also pass on to Roberta a link to his video um, for you to look at uh, that. It's a slice of what Shanghai is right now. <laughs> I would also add that, you know, the one, one benefit of being here is, um, I don't want to just say the low cost of production, but I like to produce most of my own things. So I like to build my own things. I like to do my own electronics. I like to, you know, uh, you know, and, and until it gets to a piece of machinery that is large <laughs> that I can't deal with it if it's a big metal sculpture and it needs to be bent those types of things like that I can pretty much have access to those things at a fairly cheap cost or it can be provided fairly cheaply here so there is a production thing that's happening here still that is a benefit uh, that's not the only reason uh, but you know if you were to be working in this kind of an area and getting access to a lot of those types of technologies it is a big plus um, uh, but, you know, there's also a lot of other reasons. It's a dynamically changing society. I just, and, and you could pretty much take any layer of that onion peel uh, and peel it off and find something just fascinating happening. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of other reasons that that are, are of interest. You know, I, I would say one area that really fascinates me, which goes back to this digital societies area or these digital arts is this, this, convergence of anime 3d virtual worlds and artists like Lu Yang and, and this just giant explosion that's happening here within that area and you go to a club and it's all that right or you go to a shopping mall and it's all that in in certain stores and things like that you know it's, it's much more pervasive when something becomes um underground for 15 weeks and all of a sudden it's mainstream and it's just it's it's an amazing trajectory that's going on and, and not just within production not just within economy and that kind of stuff this is the societal change and and what is 
I, I don't know if this is the right way, but what is grabbed onto and then just completely transformed, right? Uh, into something completely new, which is really fascinating to always kind of be in the middle of. So, so it's like, um, there's a lot of early adopters. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is fascinating. Um, I'd love to see that because uh, a lot of the times um, I'm, 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 I'm a little bit like kind of surprised by uh, the different ways in which people adopt uh, not just technologies, but also habits uh, at different paces in different cultures. So like I'm wondering if this is a cultural thing or uh, just uh, just the circumstances. But anyway, uh, uh, I know that uh, uh, Jane was asking something about the Antarctica project and I also had a lot of questions about it, but apparently you don't have any data yet from the scientists, which is kind of ah, I'm, like I'm burning of curiosity, especially about the um, the new um, uh, entities and the, the new organisms that are being, or new, they're not new, they're very ancient, but like the, the new to us organisms that are being found because of the, of the uh, melting of, uh, of the water and the increase of research that is being uh, doing. So like, um, do, do you know what you're gonna, you're gonna uh, focus on in the future f with this project or are you just waiting for the scientists to um, uh, produce data and then you will decide eventually what to do? Well, let me let me ask the first part, and I'm going to let Vivian t t t kind of take team this. So the data is there. Uh, it's not that there isn't any data. There's actually a, a previous paper that we could actually send out, but uh, you know, I mean, this is this is their this is their research, so we're not going to just e you know easily share it out. Uh, they've been they're in the early stages of um, uh, I can't remember how many they've finished, but they've finished so many base pairs uh, sequencing so far, and you know, all that stuff takes time. So. Um, so we're just getting access to that data now. So uh, we're obviously going to respect them and not release any specifics until they release their research papers and stuff like that. But yes, this is stuff that is definitely going to be coming online from them. And then uh, Vivian, I'm going to let you talk about some of the different experiments we're thinking about doing with the, with the data. Yeah, so, um, so uh, something that for us is... Um, uh, you know, science, I think, moves slower <laughs> than art. And so, um, so we're going at the pace of the scientists. And so they're, they're, um, I think that uh, they're, they're also, tr because it is new uh, data, so they are also making sense of it themselves, and then they have to then teach us <laughs> what it means. Um, and so we're going, uh, so we see this really as a multi-year project and really to not uh, be in a super hurry to do this, but to slowly uh, go with their pace and, and also learn from them. Um, uh, some of the, uh, I think uh, in, this, uh, in the first stage, I think we're going to um, uh, break down the um, the research process uh, of uh, ultimately we would like to make this uh, sort of publicly engaging participatory uh, virtual generated space um, that that engages with the interaction of the science uh, as well as dialogue between people across different locations. Um, but I think that um, uh, before we get there, uh, right now we're more in a stage of just modeling the data um, before we fully understand it, but just playing around with it and trying to generate just form first from, from abstract data to form and then from there slowly towards participation and interaction. And I, and I think one of, one, of, one of the conceptual ideas we have is that, you know, we have X amount of samples, 500 some samples, that each one of these samples itself could be a, a kind of a, a, a a digitally generative world in itself within a VR world where you could enter into each one of these samples and each one of these samples themselves could be a, you know, a digitally generative world. Uh, but then, you know, we also have been looking at ideas of, of kind of in the same vein as like, you know, when you apply uh, the external pressures to these populations, uh, let's say you just mapped everyone to a sphere 
as an example. Uh, so, you know, in, you're, in, and then you apply the external pressures such as temperature changes and G, uh, GPS locations and stuff like that. You'll get these kind of fluctuating uh, vertices and indices on that on that on that uh, sphere. And you know, what if you took that and then you know uh, went down to the the glass factory and made glass sculptures for them? And you know, there's a whole series of different brainstorms and ideas and outputs that we're thinking about. So you know, there's that aspect, and then there's really kind of the 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 this uh, community involvement and uh, participation. Uh, uh, aspect of how do you communicate this kind of data mm -hmm. uh, to the general public in a way where it's not so abstracted. You know, I mean, we, I, I love data visualization, but you know, it's, it, it can be extremely confusing to a lot of people. I, I mean, to me too, depending on how it's done, right? So how do you communicate something like, you know, a sample with a thousand, thousand five hundred different organisms in it and their, their populations and stuff like that, besides just presenting a graph or a chart, you know, those types of things. And, and sometimes the simplest is the best. I, I'm definitely going to say that. So, <laughs> Yeah, visualization is definitely an art. <laughs> um, there was a, a question from JJ, and I think at this, like, it's the right time to bring it up. Uh, what difference and similarities do you see in the discourse around your work between audiences in the US, Europe, and China? Um, I'll, I'll take this one. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that uh, actually not the 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 difference is not that great anymore, and I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> um, but you know, within the area of art sci, I think that everyone is you know everyone's reading similar things, everyone's discussing similar issues. Um, it, I think this is the result of a globalized society. Um, uh, but at the same time, um, actually, Ben, I think you could talk more about this whole like localized globalism uh, that you're you're you've been thinking a lot about is is uh, and I'll, I'll just lay the the, the 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 ground for that, which is this this idea of the internet again. Um, um, I, I, I'm sorry I keep bringing this up. This is a huge fascination for both of us right now. Um, the 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 internet um, and how it's basically uh, dissolved uh, old uh, boundaries of the nation state or is starting to. Um, um, and there, but yet and yet there is still globalism, but it's kind of changing flavor, and um, and and I think rather than. Um, maybe people's reaction to, to our work, um, what, what would be more interesting uh, to talk about is, is uh, some of the work that is happening, um, I think here, uh, because of this sort of uh, restructuring of, of cultural production. So like, um, and I think Ben, you, cause you've been watching this more clearly, like, uh, you know, certain musical music communities, they, um, they like coming out of China, they, they traveled and tour in Africa and then Africa's, you know, I don't know if you, I'm, I'm butchering it. Maybe, so maybe you should talk. I mean, I, I think, I, I mean, I think that, you know, there's, there's this, you know, that, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of at the cusp or at the end, but we're at the cusp of, a, of, of globalism, but also just this kind of polarized world between two large superpowers type of type of a system. A lot of it has to do with the internet. The internet's been a prime mover of this, of course. And, and you know, this isn't a necessarily a brand new conversation, but, you know, the idea of soft power used to be, you know, dropping a couple of cases of Coca-Cola in the middle of a country and being like, there's our soft power, right? Well, that doesn't work anymore, right? That, that type of interaction doesn't work as well as it used to. And now it's much more these digital tribes that are finding themselves through the internet or other types of means that are you know, bringing these kind of cultural phenomena from one country to another. But you're also seeing this dissolve on that nation state uh, kind of level where you're seeing places like New Zealand and, and um, sorry, I'm going to get the, I'm, 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 it, it's been a long day. New Zealand, I believe it was Ireland, you know, doing for like climate packs and climate trees together, right? Which is something that you wouldn't see, wouldn't have really seen, you know, a couple of decades ago because everybody would be on one side or the other. Um, for the most part, uh, that is very generalizing things, uh, but we are limited of time. But you know, so you're seeing this breakdown not just on on uh, 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 kind of community levels, 
but you're also seeing a, a, a lack of um, personal attention to the nation and more of an attention to the smaller groups of interests, right? If it's a K-pop band that all of a sudden is massive in some country, uh, you know, the reference that Vivian was talking about, you know, Shanghai has this massive kind of underground scene that's this connection between uh, here, Kenya and certain areas in, in Africa, because there's been this connection of music between the two, which is, you know, really odd. If you go on, you even CTM in Berlin and some of these other bigger music events, all of a sudden you have this real Chinese influence coming in with uh, 33 and Sansa and, and other artists, which you wouldn't have expected even five years ago. Uh, and part of that is because of these networks that are happening at such a fast pace at this time. You know, it's not to say that there wasn't these kind of cultural uh, connections between certain people, but it was done through travel. It was done through, in, in limited travel a lot of times, it was done through mail. It was done through, you know, these types of things, magazine or, or, or different types of media being moved like that. Now it's instantaneous. And I think we're just starting to get to, I don't think we're even at the tipping point or peak peak digital tribe yet in any way that between nation states and different things like that. So I think that whole thing is changing things. And so coming back to the art world question uh, and how people represent or how people understand or view art, I think there still is a very big difference. So, uh, um, but I think it is a much more, the, the, the Chinese, uh, I mean, I hate to paraphrase like this, and, and Vivian, please correct me if if if, if this song, it, it's it's more uh, it's more uh, um, educated maybe is would be the word they under they say it's exactly what Vivian was saying. We're reading the same things. Something comes out in eFlux, let's say, or uh, another magazine, digital magazine. Within sometimes hours, it's translated into Chinese and being shot out the the, the channels here for people to read. So the philosophy, the theories the reviews, the ideas are all transferring so fast now that that there isn't a one year delay, two years delay for a book to finally get passed to somebody who then maybe takes six months to read it, then translates it, and it's still in a paper format or something like that. It's very instantaneous. So you have this kind of, um, I don't know how, I don't know what the word would be. So, so I, I, I apologize. I, um, uh, of this kind of quick transfer of knowledge that is happening. So there is a much more refined view, I guess that would be the thing. Though I would say, you know, like every every area has its own flavor. So there's still a lot of, specifically Shanghai, even compared to someplace like Beijing, there's much more commercializ commercialization put within even just the artwork that's built uh, and, and produced, right? Um, uh, within its own kind of Shanghai flavor, I guess. I, I don't know how, how what would be the best, I don't know how you would describe it, Vivian. But, you know, you find that in different proportions and different, uh, different proportions in different cities anyways, right? In different groups of artists and groups of uh, art followers. So so I don't think it's, it's really not any different, right? So. But I think what's interesting is that you see the internet um, it, it, it sort of splashes into reality here locally and interacts with the local cultural culture physically. And, you know, of course, with that local culture, there is that history and social construct and, you know, um, political leaning and all those things. And then you see it kind of, what I think what's really interesting is you see it as in a, like a mishmash. Um, and then it gets splashed onto like uh, the, the clothing people wear, like, like in youth culture and all that kind of stuff. And so, um, I th and then it becomes like, uh, you know, like for instance, one of the things that's happening locally in, in Shanghai is that it's Shanghai is getting to be known for its sort of very unique fashion style and fashion world. And you see that, but that obviously comes from the, the influence from Japan and also the influence from the West. And then the influence, you know, uh, not only America, but also Europe, you know, uh, and then it, it, you, then you see it kind of mashed up together in like a club uh, on um, some 20 year olds clothing or like some cape that they're wearing to, to go to a dance party. 
This is absolutely fascinating. I love that. I could go on for hours and ask questions. But I think we are winding down to the end of this session. So like, there's a last question that I saw that I think we should address. And uh, oh yeah, uh, oh, there's something else. <laughs> um, so uh, I think that Jane, yeah, Jane was, was asking if, if there is a particular material that you would want to work with. For example, you mentioned glass. Anything in particular? I know it's kind um, of a weird. Sorry. Um, is there any? I'm just going to jump in. Hi, I just, oh, I, yeah, I was, yeah, thanks, Jane. Jane. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it was just so far away that I asked the question that it no longer makes sense. It was just you were talking about the Antarctica project and, and materializing the objects. And I thought it was fascinating that you wanted to work. You, you mentioned the glass factory. And I was just wondering what the material metaphor was, if that's important to you, if there was a specific way that you wanted to work with this, if it was all VR or that's all. Thanks. I, I mean, I, I would I would just quickly say that you know part of the idea of glass one is I, I love the material itself and it's a natural material and you're also uh, instead of virtualizing everything you're 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 creating kind of an abstraction back into a natural form which is which is a very interesting uh, uh, concept for me. Um, but I, I think we are open to, to a lot of different forms of this. We, you know, right now it's still at such early stages. Uh, I, I, you know, the virtual is definitely something we're super interested in. Uh, and, and we do like to work in that area. I mean, we, we didn't actually really represent any of that in, in any of the slides, but we do, we've done a lot of projects in, in, in the more computational digital realm and things like that. But, um, uh, that didn't. That, that didn't end up in a physical uh, manifestation. But uh, I mean, I think, you know, we're both very interested in biomaterials and natural materials and, and utilizing those, um, um, obviously. I, I'm gonna let you talk about this because this, I know this is near and dear to your heart. Well, I, I think the thing with the glass is also, um, I think the way we, we work is also, we try to learn new skills also with new projects. <laughs> Um, learn new knowledge, but also new learn new ways of working. Um, I, I think material is one of them. Collecting di different methodologies is another. Uh, collecting different uh, technical skills is another. Um, and and I, I think it also is a. Um, so we we actually are. Uh, oh, actually, for those of you who might be interested, so we actually in Quinshan we do have a contemporary uh, art center uh, called Points Center for Contemporary Art. And they actually host uh, uh, two rounds of international residencies every year. And so uh, we, we have a residency with them that was supposed to start uh, to work on some of this, but that's been delayed. So we've just been working on it ourselves. But um, they they have this, uh, they introduced us to this glass factory that is local in, in, um, in Quinshan. And so they this glass factory, they do, I think, glass printing also, like, um, uh, and so we got really excited and we thought, oh, we have to have a project that utilizes glass. Um, and I think also for the glass stage of this project, it's really just a prototype to help us think. I think that the way we think about some of these projects is uh, there's sort of ways to help us think about the next step. Um, and so um, uh, we thought it would be a good way to work with glass uh, to create the form and also with that because there are transparencies there there are things where you can do multi-layer uh, types types of data set I think that complexity also works with the complex potential uh, complexity of the data um, and then from there we could then you know with those models we can then maybe move it to a, another material or virtual world um, depends on what what happens with those experiments <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. This is uh, uh, like I I love glass uh, too. <laughs> yeah, Jane likes it too. She's like glass is such a nice material. Yes, it is, and it's also sustainable. Um, anyway, so we are at the end of our uh, session. Um, I think we should break here so that uh, we can let Vivian and Ben go to sleep because <laughs> it's very mm -hmm. night. It's very, very late at your place. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for 
such an incredible presentation and such fascinating projects. I, I definitely want to hear more about it. And uh, yeah, maybe people should uh, start thinking about doing a residency over there. And uh, <laughs> I have to think Come about something maybe. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Oh, and by the way, one thing I want to say, so you, you guys are recording all of your sessions, right? When you do your international um, um, yeah, like just to uh, work out a little, little busy and we, we don't always post them as, as, uh, promptly. Um, but maybe in over the weekend, we can post the, the site that has it. So if you just go to that site and search for me and our series, you should be able to find some. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll because I, I remember. Yeah, because I remember uh, watching a, a few of them late, of course, because uh, for me, uh, so I'm not quite an early person. Because, <laughs> of course, like for us, it's like seven o'clock in the morning or six o'clock in the morning. And I mean, like, I had like, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is the way it is. <laughs> but you can always watch it later, right? Um, anyway, okay, so um, thank you so much. And we'll keep in touch. And um, thanks to all the people who attended. I see that a lot of people attended on uh, uh, YouTube and uh, everything is uh, recorded and will be available on YouTube uh, uh, in the future through our Outside Salon channel. So you can go back and rewatch it if you want to. Great, thank you everyone. Thank, thank you, you so everybody. Much, thank you everybody. Applause uh -huh. for everybody and for you. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. You.